I now give the floor to Her Excellency Naledi Pandor, Minister for, Foreign, for International Relations and Cooperation of South Africa. Mr. President of the General Assembly, Your Excellency, Mr. Kudosi, Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. President, allow me to join all speakers before me in congratulating you on your election as President of the General Assembly and to wish you well in your role. I also thank the previous President of the General Assembly for his excellent leadership. And of course, thank Secretary General Guterres, as well as the Deputy Secretary General for their ongoing leadership of our multilateral organization. Mr. President, we meet at a time when the UN family is facing its greatest tests. Member states have to work with the United Nations to develop effective responses to the current challenges. As the theme of the General Assembly indicates, these challenges are diverse, immense, yet interconnected, and no country can respond alone. Some have referred to this moment as a key turning point in history. The COVID-19 pandemic and the Russia-Ukraine war strongly influence these attitudes today. However, for South Africa, the real inflection point will be a world attending fully to the needs of the marginalized and the forgotten. Our greatest global challenges are poverty, inequality, joblessness, and a feeling of being entirely ignored and excluded. Acting on the Common Agenda Vision 2021 of the UN Secretary General should become the major objective of this time because addressing poverty and underdevelopment will, in our view, be the beginnings of the real inflection point in human history. The Charter of the United Nations, the Universal Declaration for Human Rights, and its Human Rights Protocols all commit us to protecting all people without distinction of any kind. We must acknowledge that we face these crises today because we have not always upheld these foundational principles consistently and fairly. We believe international law matters when this one is affected, but doesn't matter when this other one is affected. That does not help to uphold international law. We have learned a great deal from the COVID-19 pandemic. It has provided us with a roadmap on what we should do as a global community and what we should not do to address global challenges. We need to use the lex lessons from the pandemic effectively. There were some noble initiatives, such as the Access to COVID-19 Tools Accelerator, which was co-chaired by President Ramaphosa of South Africa, the African Union champion for COVID-19 response, as well as the Prime Minister of Norway. This Act Day initiative laid the basis for a fairer distribution of vaccines, therapeutics, and diagnostics. We would like today to thank all the countries that have acted on their financial commitments to the COVID-19 Tools Accelerator. Mr. President, global solidarity is also required to meet other pressing challenges such as energy and food insecurity, climate change, and the devastation caused by conflicts, including the existential threat 
of nuclear weapons. Up to now, instead of working collectively to address these challenges, we have grown further apart as geopolitical tensions and mistrust permeate our relations. We should, however, move forward in solidarity, united in efforts to address our common global challenges to ensure sustainable peace and development. One of the tasks, Mr. President, that we must successfully implement is to ensure that developing countries are not left behind when treatments are available. We must do this by creating and supporting research and innovation capacity in Africa and other parts of the world for vaccine production, by investing in strengthened public health systems, and by ensuring that we produce thousands more qualified professional health workers. All this requires sustainable investment in higher education research institutions and in global research cooperation. The mobilization of resources and capabilities to strengthen the pandemic response and the preparedness of all nations must be substantially increased. It will be a tragic indictment on all of us as leaders if future pandemics find the poorest countries as unprepared as many were for COVID-19. We need to strengthen global health architecture to ensure that we are better able to meet the challenges of new pandemics and other infectious diseases of concern. We are proud as South Africa to be part of the solutions to these problems through the recent establishment of the first mRNA global technology transfer hubs that will contribute to the security of supply of life-saving medication for African countries and other developing countries. Mr. President, my country, South Africa, like many other developing countries, faces huge development challenges, including in our energy sector. We need to together collectively address global energy shortages, including by deploying innovative solutions that are cheaper, cleaner, and more accessible. Working with international partners, South Africa is developing its Just Energy Transition Plan to significantly reduce harmful emissions in our country. We are working on an expanded green economy intervention that is gaining significant momentum in our country. I would like, Mr. President, to commend the Secretary General for focusing attention during this General Assembly on transforming education. Education remains one of the most important drivers to end poverty and inequality, and we will work toward increasing access to education that is affordable as a country and a continent. South Africa has no fee schools at primary and secondary level to allow the most vulnerable learners to access compulsory education. We also have a state bursary scheme for poor students who qualify for tertiary education. These measures have over the years served to increase the enrollment of learners who were previously unable to access education. In the field of research and innovation, we believe we need more partnerships such as the Square Kilometer Array Science Infrastructure Project hosted in South Africa and Australia. This is an international partnership that is one of the largest joint scientific endeavors in history. Partnerships of this nature must be encouraged to leverage scientific breakthroughs for development purposes. We also believe the multilateral trading system must be strengthened so that we genuinely create a conducive environment for fair trade and one that also provides opportunities for developing economies. If actionable steps such as these are not taken, developing countries will remain 
subject to an imbalanced global financial and trading system. Let us, Mr. President, use this moment of renewal to reiterate our commitment to multilateralism as the only means of building a better world. The United Nations must, of course, itself be transformed so that it serves its role cognizant of current global dynamics. It is unacceptable that 77 years after its establishment, five nations wield disproportionate decision-making power in the United Nations system as a whole. Transformation of the UN must include more representative, transparent, and accountable organs of global governance. For this body to be effective, the General Assembly must be revitalized, the Security Council must be reformed. We also cannot have a credible organization if it cannot hold persistent transgressors of the Charter to account. Mr. President, we believe we must act immediately to protect the environment and the world we live in for ourselves and for future generations. While Africa is the least responsible for the climate crisis, it does find itself at the epicenter of its worst impacts. We should therefore emerge from COP26 27 in Egypt with an agreement that contains enhanced and balanced actions on adaptation, mitigation, and financing. This, of course, must take into account our common but differentiated responsibilities and our respective capabilities. In addition, we must agree at COP27 on a mechanism for loss and change. In South Africa, our cabinet has approved wide-ranging policies to ensure that we can meet our newly determined climate change targets. We have established a climate finance task team to lead and coordinate negotiations with international partner groups to give effect to the Just Energy Transition Partnership. The partnership seeks to address South Africa's investment needs in infrastructure to facilitate our coal phase down in a manner that ensures that no one is left behind. Mr. President, I don't need to reiterate that building a better world requires peace and stability. South Africa continues to believe that conflict resolution must not come through fueling conflicts but through investing in efforts aimed at political dialogue. We should aspire to peace as a global public good. There have been no winners of the wars of the past seven decades. Instead, they engendered strife, distrust among nations, divisions, as we see this week, a perpetual misallocation of resources to weapons, increased poverty, and underdevelopment. All these are features and effects of war. While we work to address contemporary conflicts, we should not ignore long-standing conflicts, such as that of the people of Palestine, which has been on the United Nations agenda throughout the seven decades of existence of this organization. We cannot ignore the words of the former Israeli negotiator at the Oslo talks, Daniel Levy, who addressed the UN Security Council recently and referred to the increasingly weighty body of scholarly, legal, and public opinion that has designated Israel to be perpetrating apartheid in the territories under its control. Israel must be held accountable for its destructive actions that have significantly impaired the possibility of a two-state solution. Similarly, we cannot ignore the decades-long struggle for self-determination of the people of Western Sahara. We must, Mr. President, treat all conflicts across the globe with equal indignation, 
no matter what the color or creed of the people affected is. South Africa calls for an end to the embargo against Cuba, which continues to impede the right to development of her people. In the same vein, we call for an end to unilateral coercive measures against Zimbabwe, which have compounded the problems experienced by the people of Zimbabwe and have a detrimental effect on the broader Southern African region. Mr. President, our quest to build a better world will remain unfulfilled as long as people are still discriminated against on the basis of race, gender, sex, ethnic, social origin, color, sexual orientation, age, disability, religion, conscience, belief, culture, or language. We have a responsibility to make sure that every girl child receives an education and that every woman has an opportunity to work, to study, to begin a business, and to have choice and control over her life and body. We must also ensure that more women speak at the United Nations General Assembly. We need to end the violence perpetrated against the most vulnerable, most often women and children. We have witnessed that women in conflict situations are particularly vulnerable, including women journalists. The murder of Shireen Abu Akle and other journalists is a stark reminder of the danger that women in conflict situations face. We must do all we can to protect them and exert all effort to hold those accountable for harming them. We must also strengthen the capacity and draw on the voices of the youth on the African continent. In this regard, we need to harness the demographic dividend by maximizing our investment in quality education as a means to address intergenerational poverty together with inclusive economies. Mr. President, Africa is home to more than 1.3 billion people. It is fast emerging from centuries of colonialism, occupation, and exploitation, from willful neglect and underdevelopment. We now have an African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement, and the countries of Africa are laying a firm foundation for a new era of trade, commerce, and productivity. Our countries are establishing the conditions for the seamless flow of goods and services between African markets, for the growth of industry, and for the construction of roads, bridges, railway lines, ports, and power stations that will support growth. As we continue our efforts to end war, conflict, and insurgency, in several parts of our continent and to prevent the unconstitutional seizure of power, we will continue to see greater alignment between our agenda and that of the United Nations and our body, the African Union. To overcome all these acutely global challenges, we must agree to a common path out of an increasingly polarized world, a rules-based international system predicated on international law and strict adherence to the provisions of the UN Charter is essential. Such a system should safeguard the interests of all and not only the powerful countries. We acknowledge the efforts of Secretary General Guterres in his vision, our common agenda, which we support very, very strongly. We believe he has provided us with options to put aside our differences, to build trust, and to forge a world where future generations will prosper and thrive. That should be the mandate we adopt and not the mandate of division and conflict. I wish you well, Mr. President, and I thank you for this opportunity. I thank the Minister for International Relations and Cooperation.